Okay. You know, Mike, on your uh, Windy Cities uh, presentation the other night, I was trying to say that uh, that the PowerPoint was not uh, in full screen mode. It wasn't in it wasn't in slideshow mode. Yeah. So so it made everything smaller. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, hey, you know, you should re you should record those too to um, and then you can post them on YouTube. I got really good uh, feedback from the members on it. Um, hi. Because we have, uh, hi. Because, uh, you know, we have some fairly experienced people, but uh, I guess some of the things that I bring up in my meetings, they have never heard of, um, like, um, you know, some of the terms that are used to describe the operation of the, the web telescope. And uh, uh, also uh, a little tidbit about the, the fact that because of a special mask that they have, that they can break um, the, the limit of the 1.22 art seconds per inch or whatever. Uh, down to 0.5 by using a form of interferometry. And so they're using that to gather all sorts of, of, of detail. But um, what, um, what I went on to explain, because I, I went on for an hour, was how does... Um, how does uh, making a telescope that doesn't require any cooling go down to close to to, um, to absolute zero? How everything affects the design and the operation and the orbit and everything else about it, you know? And uh, I think I did a pretty good uh, job on that. It looks the way it looks. It goes where it goes, and it has um, a certain um, way of looking at the um, at the uh, at the universe because it's trying to get down to absolute zero with no power and, and it, you know it's what are we talking about uh, the uh, web telescope the what the web telescope web. oh the web telescope <laughs> yeah um Let's see here. Mike, Mike did a Windy Cities Observatory uh, presentation about uh, to to the folks there. I, okay. I tuned into, but I forgot most of it. <laughs> <laughs> the re there 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 are several things uh, uh, about the. Uh, oh, I don't know. I, I I'm not sure if you want me to go through any of it, but but basically. Um, there are two things that make this telescope successful in where what it looks at, and that's getting it down to cold. It's employing the Lagrange point, and also having one heck of a solar shield. Everything else about the operation of design falls from that to reduce the temperature so that you can see the coldest things in the universe which means you can see further back in time. And uh, uh, the, the reason is, is that because of the, the solar screen is always um, between it and the sun. So it radiates the way the heat and it's the first uh, of a uh, large telescope in space that's open, completely open. And the reason is it's radiating heat away from itself to reduce the temperature. And uh, the, um, oh, and you got the, 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 the website, yeah. So it kind of tells you, this is, this is real time of the telescope. So um, like I, I told everybody at the meeting, the web telescope when it's operating will never see the light of day. <laughs> <laughs> at least not our day yes and yeah. um 
thermal and, shields are very unique too. They're not absolutely flat intentionally. No. So that the heat that uh, is, that they're capturing actually makes multiple bounces and ends up going out the edge. That's right. And every time it goes from one to another, it goes down a major step in its uh, temperature. Um, and uh, uh, another thing too- well, I'm talking within two sheets. Yeah, but it's got six. So, so, it is, so it cools it even even further. This is all passive. Um, I, I guess the, the Hubble telescope had some active uh, and, uh, um, but also um, I showed here, I will, I'm, well, hold a second here, exit full, what I want to do. I will, uh, I'll just show a couple points. I, sorry for, Taking over on here one second this time. We got Ed, Ed Klasky wants to mention about a serial to come with um, okay. adapter. Okay, and, let's go. Uh, let's go talk about his. Do I do that? Okay, Ed, did, did have any comments about your uh, adapter? Did you find it? Did you get it? Or you're asking questions? Yeah, I uh, found two different companies that provide a um, USB to serial port software and it's you know i never i'm not i'm not going to have a rs-232 i don't have an rs-232 connection all i have is a connection that comes from my camera which is a usb and then i have a controller a hand controller that goes to the mount now i assume that phd2 needs a com uh, file connector and uh, therefore I have to create a virtual com file connector so that I can have uh, my USB connection look like a com file connector. Now the first place I found was this MOXA company and it sounded like they really you know are dealing with other companies and not with individuals per se. But then uh, recently I found this US converters and down below on this listing of uh, US converters, they have USB to serial ports. And yeah, they're about them, 10 bucks, a little, little lumpy thing. I got several of them. Yeah, I don't know how much it costs. To, well, they're not much money, that's the whole point. Oh, well, the thing is, it says free on the top of the list. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, N not these guys, the other uh, the other guys. These guys do charge something. One of the things that a lot of people have issues with is the serial adapters, the, the chip inside. They're not all built the same. And um, the serial adapter to use that has the least amount of problems is uh, FTDI, I believe it is, uh, the, the product name. They seem to be more compatible with uh, more programs than any other. This US converters, they seem to highlight the one that I need. Ooh, okay, FTDI. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That is uh, that is a safe bet. I think uh, probably Ed has a uh, what is it uh, a four pin connector for the serial or six pin. Uh, is that right, Ed? The just... No, the serial here. There's a picture of the serial. That's uh, twenty five connectors. Oh, yeah. you have a twenty five pin. Twenty five. I think they're twenty five. And the USB is uh, essentially a 24 uh, connection. Really? I know it looks like a nine, doesn't it? Yeah, well, yeah. they used yeah. to be 26 and then they, they they did a whole lot of chit chat back and forth that you really don't need and the newer one, and then, then it went down to nine. Well, There's the one I have, it was made by- Didn't the 25 used to be like a parallel connection? Well. I don't know. Let me grab the. <laughs> There's one that looks like an Ethernet to serial converter. 
but that's not what you're after, right? I think he wants uh, one that goes to the port on the on the Celestron mount, uh, which I think is like a telephone or or Ethernet connector. Oh, right? yeah. So you need to do a little bit of soldering. Well, hold a second. No, uh, usually oh, what it is that, that that connector is a telephone to a DB nine connector. Yeah. You know what? The one I have is a nine nine pin. You had it there for a second. Yeah, there it is. This, this is the, oh, that's USB. You want serial to this one? It is a serial USB. cable. No, this I can't even it use this. It's only the software that I can use. Hmm. You know, well, uh, the, the thing is, is that that top one looks like it, that. Well, here's a Celestra next to our EQ. Six PC link to hand controller RS two thirty two serial converter cable. So right. Ed, I think I think you'd have something like this, wouldn't you? Just yeah. kind of looks like a, a telephone connector RJ eleven or yeah, that goes into my uh, computer mount. Right. So you, you don't even need to use your RS two thirty two uh, your telephone to to uh, DB nine. You could use that instead. It looks like the. Uh... USB connector has got a big fat end on it, and it's probably got some electronics in there to do the conversion. Yeah, it is, and it uses the uh, the best chip, the FTDI uh, USB. Yeah. Okay. Uh, like I say, this one I have is made by Sabrin. I guess you can't see it because you're already on other things. Um, but uh, I use this to talk to the Oregon computer, which is a uh, RS-232, but it's just got TX and RX. That's it. Nothing else. That's it. it, it that's yeah, all they require. It's just fine. I, I plug this. This goes, uh, the other end of this is a USB. It's already plugged into my computer. This plugs into another cable that goes across, the, uh, across my office. <laughs> what I'm trying to do we is get a COM the, port so I can run PHD2. Yes. That's the objective. Yes, you don't you you don't need to use the um, the telephone to uh, uh, to USB nine and then a USB nine to uh, I mean a DB nine to a USB. You just use this. It's just one cable. It's less to go wrong. I I don't understand what this <laughs> USB is to. RJ11 and RJ12, those are six conductor uh, items. Why are we even talking about this? Well, uh, you're, you're trying to uh, talk from your laptop to the mount. Is that right, Ed? Yes. And the, the mount, um, I think, has like a, it might be six pins, but they're only showing using four here of the six. Yeah. The transmit and receive and they're couple only ground. Two. One is no connect, two is transmit data, three is ground, four is ground, five is receive data, and six is no connect. Yeah, so there's right. only two of those six that do something. Well, the three, you need the ground. You need to receive. Well, all right, receive. yeah, gra granted, granted. Yeah. How is this going to help with my uh, running uh, PhD2? Well, it's controlling your, uh, your mount, right? So you're trying to, PhD2 has to talk to the Celestron mount. And so that you need a, a conversion and and whether you connect, I don't know if this is supposed to connect to the hand controller or connect directly to the mount. I'm I'm not clear on that point. Well, I thought that somehow going through the um, through my camera, my camera yeah, you, connects you a go. USB to the camera, right. and that camera is supposed to be linked to the uh, auto guide camera. You could do one that, two uh, ways. Well, you can do, you can do it the um, from from the camera directly to the mount directly using the telephone. But uh, a lot of times you don't even need that. You use you go via the software you're using from PhD. PhD guiding will can be told uh, to use either the ST4 interface, which is what you're talking about, or USB. If you were to just use the, the ST4, then you would go in PhD 
guiding and select on camera. Well, the ST4 connects from the uh, camera on the auto guiding directly to the mount. Okay, then then the PhD guiding, you would select the, um, the control to be uh, on camera and that would send it directly to the mount. You know, I have a, an adapter that I use with the um, <clears throat> Orion um, hand controllers, the Sinstran, Sins, what are they, Sinstran, uh, that, uh, are, right, they're, are, they're are, um, USB on one end and they are the connector on the other and there's a lump in the middle. And so that I can uh, upgrade the firmware in the uh, hand controller, it works. What, did, what do you do, Jerry? For running Relative computer? to your problem of getting a connection, I'm still not really clear what the problem is. The problem is that I want to run PhD2 uh, for my yeah, guide. I, I, yeah, I, I got that and, part. Okay. And when I tried to do that, PhD2 says that it will only look at a COM port. It will not accept a USB port. So you have a USB to COM port adapter. Yeah, I don't see the, I have to, I'm not, I'm on the wrong computer to explore that at the real time. And I thought you had it last time, but my COM ports will accept USB. You have COM ports? I do on my laptop. I don't on this computer. It doesn't come on Windows 10. No, I'm working Windows 7 Pro. Remember, I spent extra Seven money has to it. upgrade to Windows 7. Yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> but, hey, well, but Ed, you know, I think um, by using that serial adapter, then, then you might see information say, saying that uh, now you have a COM port and that you can talk to the mount uh, and they'll say, you know, specify the baud rate or whatever, 9600 baud or something. And so I think you'll you'll end up you'll have a COM port if you have that adapter. Well, I don't know if it's the adapter or the software. I was under the impression that it's the software that I need, not the not the adapter. Well, I think since the the laptop is is thinking that you have all you have is USB ports, you need something that plugs into one that changes changes it to a COM port, a serial COM port, and then you can then you can talk to it like it's a serial COM port. I I think I'm not sure. I, I that do that in software that I have written that talks to a lump that actually talks to another interface, which none of you probably use, the I, IEEE 488. And uh, you have to go into a control panel and go down to your ports. And you, that's where I select that whatever it's going to call COM1 is actually USB1 or whatever. So you, you may have some setup that you need to do to make it work. Let me Correct. ask you. I'm, 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 I'm looking at PhD guiding and what it says connect up the equipment. Okay, on the mount, it has ZWO USB SD4 ASCOM. There is a, a thing there that allows you to go using the ASCOM drivers to simulate the USB, it looks like. But you can't go to PhD two. Let me let me make some comments here, here. Go ahead. and ask some questions. You remember Bob Petak? He's in our club. A member? Hmm. Yes. No. No. A little bit. I remember him well. Yeah. Okay. Well, he's an amateur astronomer, obviously, but he also has his own business of him and another guy up in the place just south of Santa Maria. That's uh, right. And he makes, for a while, he makes... An uh, Orchid? Um, Orchid, yeah, that's where he is. And yep. he's now working, making cameras with the guy that I consulted with down here in uh, Goleta at Cyan Systems. But Bob made, under the uh, Fish Camp engineering label, he made a Starfish CMOS guider, guiding telescope. And I had that scope. And I use it most of the time for guiding and connecting with PHP2. And um, when Windows 8 came out, um, I couldn't connect PHD to 
that camera uh, wouldn't do it. And so I talked to Bob about it and he said, well, the, the utilities on Windows 8 um, reassign, they bundle the different subroutines that are needed to make them, to, needed to connect. They bundle it differently than all previous windows. And so there's the, the driver has to be completely rewritten to go to Windows 8. So the option for me was to buy another guide camera, which I didn't like. Um, and, the, and I had other problems with other equipment also that needed new drivers to match the Windows 8 and then Windows 10. And rather than do that, I just took all my computers and I brought them back to Windows 7. Now all my equipment connects with through all the drivers that came with the equipment. Now my equipment is fairly old. I didn't want to pay all that money to get new, new, new material, new cameras and stuff. Um, so I'm using all the old drivers. The old drivers will not fate interface with Windows 8 and Windows 10. You might be running into something like that. So let me ask you, when, when were the drivers for your cameras and telescope mount made? They're all new drivers. They're all new They're drivers? All, okay. And it's all done through ASCOM. Then if the person making that um, driver has up to the latest software, then you should be having no problems with that. I, I don't have a problem with that. The problem okay. is with running the uh, PhD too. Right. That's why I can't help you with this. I was not I'm sure. in a niche. So PhD two here is showing just USB cables coming out, one to the camera yeah. and one to the one to the scope mount. Yeah. That's so, what I have. So Ed is just having a problem. Sounds like uh, getting a, a a port to to talk to PhD two. That's a serial to the to the mount, and those cables that convert uh, USB to serial seem like maybe the way to go to this RJ twelve six pin, but uh, only using four pin mount uh, connector connection point. Three pins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Whatever. The most yeah. important thing about PhD too is right at the top of your screen there, when it says while well, letting PhD handle guiding and dithering in a coordinated way. That's the reason that I use PhD too because the dithering, uh, which is key to getting really good image processing, uh, is so critical. Well, I found software that will convert my uh, USB connection to look like a com, com okay. connection. I have not tried it and I wanted to hear from you, Jerry, as to how you were doing it. I didn't realize that you were still in Windows 7. Yeah, the Stone Age. But um, yeah. let me give you, um, when I get problems with any of the Stark labs, I call, uh, what's Craig Stark? Call him up and ask him about this. He will help you. He always helps me. He's easy to talk to, and he's always been very helpful and eager to do it. What's his last name again? S T A R K. D A. Okay. Like the guy in the movies. I uh, like except a different first name, and his uh, <laughs> his uh, company is called. I think it used to be called Stark Labs. And he does nebulosity and PhD. Of course, PhD, he's let loose now in open software. So everybody, it's run like sort of like Wikipedia, where people go in and rewrite his software. Can I ask a question on uh, what, uh, two things. Uh, when Hank used to come all the time, he was really good with PhD2. Yeah. Uh, what, I, what I understood is that the PhD2 was kind of a standalone computer. It didn't have to go through anything. Didn't have to go through any what? It has to hook up to your camera. But it didn't. It, but it didn't. Ha it had. It was like its own computer. It didn't have. Well, it no, didn't it's, have it's to run. Soft, it's software. It has to be on a computer platform. Oh, so now what is a COM port? Communications. Yeah, it's like a USB port. Only it's an older version. If you have a laptop with page four, in on four, here. Four, five. If you have a laptop with four or five USB ports available on it, 
the computer will assign them a COM number, whichever one you plug into, that'll be some COM number. And if you change it to another one, you have to tell the computer that what used to be COM3 is now COM2. Yeah. So on, on, edge, on, edge, yeah, on edge computer, on edge computer, the USBs don't assign the USB. I'm assuming they're a USB three. They don't. They don't assign the port as a COM port. That's correct. Well, it can go be. down to page ten on here. It'll tell you PH two PHD two requires you have a COM port. Good. Right in the second paragraph here. I think it's so you buy one of the dongles, the USB to a right here, port uh, converter, and it, and it works. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think Bruce, right I over. Think Bruce is right. Yeah. Okay. Just buy buy the buy the dongle the, and it'll convert to a make it into a serial port for you. And I use software. several of them. They're they're ver they just work. I don't have to worry about any of this stuff. The only problem I have is when on my software in, in my lab in the basement. <clears throat> Uh, I have written software that talks to a COM port. Yeah, that covers your thing right in in that paragraph right there. That solves it. This you one where the buy, cursor is? Buy the dongle and get the software that supports it. Um, so hopefully, window, hopefully Windows would recognize the port as being a serial port. And then I'm not sure, I think under these um, connect... Uh, uh, symbols It'll, here that you have to tell it what kind of uh, speed the COM port has or not. I can't remember. Yeah, 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 right. You can go up to 115,000 if you want. That's a good website you got there. That's that's their user guide for PhD two. Yeah. yeah. It sounds like Ed is familiar with this. <laughs> yes. They say if you buy the connector. The USB to serial uh, adapter that you get software with it that will do will do the COM port thing, but it turns out at least at the Best Buy you do not get the software with the well, connector. Basically, that's built into to... Windows as far as I'm yeah. I know. I mean, yeah, I it, use these things. They're discover... USB. They plug into my computer. My computer does not have a COM port at all. Yeah, right. You have a Windows it... 10. No, I'm using Windows 7. I hate Windows 7. Yeah, Windows I, 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 7 I, I, does it. I already said that. I told Jerry. Okay. Yeah, but when you connect it in, it'll say, I detect new software. And then um, Windows usually says, okay, I'm going to go. I've got a bunch of drivers. I'll use it for this one because it looks like it's going to work. And if it doesn't, it says, I need to go outside. Is it okay to download the driver? And then it'll download it from the web. You forget the major reason that Windows keeps upgrading Windows is so they and, and have to use new software and different drivers so they can make more make more money. They're gonna right. sell you stuff. It doesn't no. actually is not a, a better user experience. No. Oh, you're so cynical, Bruce. Oh, no, I'm not. I, 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 that's why I wouldn't real. upgrade from Windows Seven. Yeah, he's being realistic. I think yeah, Windows Eleven looks a lot different than ten. Ten looks a lot different than eight. <laughs> Yeah, well, Windows 11. All sorts of gremlins in them. Windows, yeah. Windows 11 looked just frustrating to me because I don't want to use it because I put my taskbar on the left hand side and Windows 11 doesn't allow that. They only want the taskbar down at the bottom and that's going to just drive me crazy. So I'm, I'm waiting second, to upgrade. Tom, in that second paragraph you have up there, it says most shall ask Tom uh, run. It, it later says the software that comes with the USB serial adapter will create a software COM port. So, to, so Ed saying he didn't get the software. He didn't get the so adapter. If you look at that other page I had that I gave you, uh, Tom, it said yeah. US uh, converters. Down on this page two of US converters, it uh, the article is called uh, Control Panel Two. Let's see, or five steps for selecting the right USB for no, the no, serial no. adapter. Control Panel Two, the one I uh, mailed to you. Uh, it starts yeah. out Control Panel Two. That's not it. You showed it at the very start. Yeah, I got it here. Just I thought I, I could back up. These are the that. two. Those are two web pages that were I had. So you're talking about 
this you are, page you right here. Page two of that article. Yeah. Okay, scan down. Right a little more further down. Just up there. Okay, see, I said this is it. XS880, and that's about the fifth one down. And that says USB to RS232 Ultimate. And it says drivers and uh, download sheets, data sheets. So I'll I was share, and I'll show it to you here. The web page that it goes to at, eight, at 880 is this one here, blinking oh. lights. But see, this does not match up to your mount, right? That's it, correct. I don't need the connector. All I need is the software. Oh, you just think you can get just the software? No, I think it's need both. Uh, I, I, I think, yeah, uh, you, you buy something, I mean, you use software from the place that's. I, I think you need that RJ12 connector at the end instead of this 910, you get one of those and, and then and then get the, uh, hopefully the Windows will recognize it, I hope, and uh, turn it into a serial port for you. Did you open that serial to Ethernet converters up there on the left? Uh, up, up here, just a whole bunch oh, of down, down on the left under categories to the left. Categories. See uh, the guy hope, leaning right around the sign right down a little bit? The serial this, to Ethernet. Oh, you, you serial to Ethernet? Yeah, okay. open that. Okay. The fifth one down. I think that'll be all these. That's for Ethernet, which you know it's not used by the mount. No. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So. Man, this stuff is complicated. It can be. So do you think? Do you think that Ed needs some? You were saying a dongle. That's a. That's just a little. It's an adapter, right? Right. So. So, uh, one should be an RJ11 here. Anything that dangles off the port in your computer is a dongle. Okay, so so the so one end is a, is the USB, and that goes into your camera, Ed. Yes, it goes directly to my camera. And so the other end has to be something that converts the port that you're going to be using, which is what. On your on your la on your laptop, I got two connections to my telescope. One is to the camera, and one is to the mount. And I assume that the USB auto guiding is done through the camera, which is then attached to the auto camera. Let's see. There's two ways to do it, generate the guiding signal, depending on your camera and how you cook, hook it up. One is to have the camera generate the signal, the guide camera. The other one is to have the computer take the data and generate the signal. One is much faster than the other, and I forget which one I use, but it's the faster one. I would assume it's the first one because it doesn't yeah. have to go through the computer. Yeah, I, I think you're right. So um, what kind of camera do you have, Ed? I have uh, ZWO cameras. I have two ZWO cameras. Um, the auto guided one is uh, 120 ASI 120. And I have that one. And I don't even use the ST4. I just go through. I I, I just go through the the laptop. It has the. ASCOM hub where PhD tells, goes through a software switch to the mount saying, go here, go there, uh, move this much. Well, they don't tell it to move that much. They just tell it move, 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 or don't move. Yeah. Well, it's it's sort of like a pulse guiding. It, tell, uh, it, it simulates the relay contacts uh, via the USB and it's able to change the amount of time that you're sending a move command so that you get more granularity. 
It's called uh, Force can, Guiding. Can you put up a display of the camera he's talking about? It's a ZWO. Yeah. ZWO, ASI. What is it, 1600? Oh, 20 is the guide camera. Now, do you have the small one or the or the pancake one? It really doesn't matter, but uh, yeah. Okay, I see a U USB B there, and on the other one, it looks like it's a um, what is it? Uh, ST4 connector. Yeah, ST4. That's what I was looking for. And those are the only two connections. Correct. Yes. Okay. It's so power ST from USB. The ST4 goes to the mount. Yeah, where it's labeled auto guide. Yeah, that's where it gets this. It takes the signal out and sends it to your mouth. So my mount takes an art. Say it again, RT4. RT4 mount there and at both ends and it goes into the mount as an RT4. Or RJ4? RJ4, excuse me. RJ4. Yeah, so that would be <laughs> RJ4 to RJ4. The other one goes um, USB-B to USB-A inside my computer. So those are the only two connections you need to worry about. Out of where stock. Do get, where do you get the serial? I believe he's thinking but, about the serial to his, uh, to his controller on his mouse. His mount doesn't have an, a USB. It has an RS-232 connection. Is that well, correct? The mount, should, the mount should have an R, RJ-4 on that connection for guiding. Well, that would be using the ST-4 connector from the auto guider. ST-4, yes. yeah, ST-4, excuse me. This is a new mount, Ed, isn't it? Yes, it is. OK, so. It, it's CGX dash. What kind of mount is it? Ed, what's that? A, it, what kind of mount is it? Celestron CGX. Okay, yeah. can you display that? Yeah, it just see. dash L. It's the bigger one, or dash L Pro, I think. I was hoping I'd find a a cable <laughs> picture well, we of a cable setup. Like to see the control panel that has the ports. Yeah. I've got the CGX here. Got to be somebody who has it set up. Celestron. Propagator. I mean, I can show just a. Hold on. Let me just go to the CGX. And. And uh, it's that's a smaller mount. Mine's yeah. CGX dash L of the right mount. Yep. Come on. There. That's it down there. Whoop, you went past there. It's here. Uh, don't need a tripod, just need the mount. Right. And let's see if I can get a picture here of. It's showing the, the hand controller coming into the back, a uh, couple yeah. of ports here. That's a different port. Try those other pictures down below. It'll show something. I'm trying. There. I'm trying. Yeah, that actually that might, be, might be the best one. Yeah, there. that's it. That, that shows it all. Yeah, up just at the top of your image there on the right-hand side, there's right. like three uh, connections. So one on the right is auto guider. Make it bigger. Okay, I don't see any serial connector up there. No, there isn't. So what do you need a serial connector for? I don't. Oh. I need the oh. software. Well, you know what? That is different from mine. I don't have the ports up here on, on the... That's amazing. Yeah, you know, I've got ports on the side here and back here. I don't have the uh, ports There's up one here. on the right there. I think there's there's two yeah. ports. You can this use is, this says one. auto guide and this says auto guide. Could you stop it from jumping around? I can't read it. <laughs> it's this auto guider, the one on the right. 
Yeah. It's a six pin yeah. connector. That goes from your camera direct to there and it's an RJ4 on each end. Uh, S, yeah, ST4. ST4, SCAR, sorry. It looks like there's two auto guider ports there, one up above and one down below on the side. That's correct. Those are all auxiliary ports. You can use them for what you want. Yeah, the aux oh, auto guider on the side. The hand controller it's, plugs into one of the aux ports. Yeah. Yeah. Usually it, one it or two. It turns out I think this one on the on the side is blocked. So I can't weird. use it even if I wanted to use it. Oh weird. I have to call them about that. Where's the manual? Manual tell us more. Yeah, there's a manual here somewhere. Let's see. Uh, there's got to be a set of manual in here somewhere, huh? How much does that mount weigh? It's, it's uh, got 50 a 70 pounds. How many? Yeah. 50. 50. Okay. I saw some guy holding it with one hand. Yeah. Well, it's actually 48. <laughs> Makes a difference, huh? Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, my mount was the same. I was going to say you're off by two pounds. My MISO weighs uh, 50 pounds and it carries 200 pounds. It's nice to have that handle, though, when yeah. you want to move the mount around. Yeah. I had to make a handle for my Orion. It's made out of rope and a piece of plastic pipe. Oh, there you go. But does it need ASCOM? Oh, you got it up there. Okay. I'm just joking. We'll give her page 11 here. Let's see. Oops. Auto guide ports. Only for use of auto guide camera relays. It's, it says it's equipped with a redundant auto guider port located next to auxil aux three and four near the dovetail right. saddle. You only use one auto guide port. Just the best option for you. So they're trying to make it closer to where the camera might be mounted on top of the scope by putting it up by the oh, dovetail yes. mount. But the thing is, is that it's got a USB port on the mount. And you should be able to connect between PhD guiding and the mount and do the thing. Can, is a whole second to be used with ASCOM or third? Oh, whole second is not intended. Why would they want to do something like that? Oh, so they want you to use the, the hand controller's mini USB port on the hand controller. Oh yeah, oh. that's interesting. Uh, what? Not intended to be used with. Oh, I didn't read that. I didn't miss that. So you're supposed to go oh, through yeah. the hand controller. Why would they say that? Well, because obviously what? they uh, it's they've got multiple computers in there, and this one isn't tied to the smarts that controls it. The smarts that controls it's probably in the hand controller. Yeah. Well, it, says, it says the USB port on the mount is used to interface with your PC for use with the delicate with with the dedicated telescope control software, which they give you a copy of. Simply uh, connect the USB B type cable and the USB port on the mount, and plug it into your PC. The mount should talk to the COM port on your devices, but not intended for ASCOM control. Interesting. Oh. And they the, provide the, the software. On the, on the hand controller, you've got this mini USB port. It's on the bottom of the hand controller. Yes. Okay. Um, and, and so somebody tried to explain PC that to, to me. control telescope with desktop or to perform firmware updates. Okay. This is where you would connect your 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 telescope to um, using the hub, the USB hub, which goes between your planetarium software, your camera software, and um, PhD guiding would go into this one. 
that's where you connect up to. Well, I assume that your PhD two would talk through the hand controller to yeah. your auto guider camera. I mean, uh, no, it's getting the information from the auto guider camera separately. And this is talking to the, the to the mount to control the mount yeah. to right via PhD two. So yeah, it's a US so it's USB from your computer to mini USB on the yes. hand controller to talk to the mount. Right. No need for uh, RS 232. No, no serial com talking. Huh? Sounds pretty good to me. I'd try that. So, but how can I, I can't use PhD2 then. Yes, you can. That's the third party software. Yeah, PhD2 would talk from your laptop to your hand controller through, through the bottom of the hand controller. Right. And that's how you'd control the, but your camera will, will go into the laptop separately. And yes. then PhD2 two sees the camera and then it talks out to the mount to control the mount mm -hmm. via the Whoa. hand controller port. Whoa. That's roundabout, but I think that's how it works. Yes. So the auto guider camera really doesn't um, connect to the mount, it seems like. It seems you just go directly to your PC, and then your PC from THD2 goes back out to the mount. That's. Mm. Oh, no. I so the auto, no, I'm not no. sure what the auto guider, guider port on the, uh, on the mount does then. Give us give a try to. Give a try there, Ed, and then let us know. Yeah, I know. I know you're skeptical. I can hear it. So it says auto guide camera relays. Auto auto guide port only used for auto guide camera relays. And redundant ports. So I don't know what what that means. Auto guide camera relays. Never, okay. Good, well, caution. Never plug the next hand controller or other accessory into the. Oh, okay. Be, yeah. You know why? because they use the same type of plug for either one and that would... Uh, Do they have different voltage? Yeah, different voltage would blow it. <laughs> so, so can somebody explain one more time what, you know, what Ed could, could plug? You plug the camera in separately into the computer? Yes. yes. With what? A USB, USB cable. to USB? Yeah, USB to uh, to the hand yeah, controller. No, you you plug you. I think Ed, you need two USB cables, one from the camera to the PC, and the other one from the mini USB on the hand controller to the PC, and that's what you need to control, I believe, your auto guiding. With what oh. software? It's part of ASCOM and it's part of PhD guiding too. Well, there's a very, that statement earlier on PhD two says you have to have a COM port. So somehow I have to have a virtual COM port. No, no, it, it's, 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 it's ignoring it. It's going to a hub, a software hub that goes between the camera and the mount. There's this widget called uh, software, and it. I don't think you need the serial in this case. If you select the proper um, mount, pull down on the menu, pull down menu. Now, what are the connectors on the AS on the uh, the uh, the ca the cameras again? It's one is one an ST four. Yes. Yes. And what's the other one? The other one is if you're using the camera normally as a camera. The ST four is used for auto guiding. 
So you're going to be going from ST4 from the ca from the camera. You're going with that ST4 into a U USB on the computer. No, no. You go oh. to the auto guide on the mount. But I think uh, Ed, I think you just want to use the USB port only down down to the uh, laptop or to the com computer, and and forget about the ST4 cable. You know somebody on YouTube said that you can forget the uh, the ST4 cable, but and he even takes the cable out and burns it on the sidewalk. But he doesn't tell you how to connect things up if you don't use the ST4. You just just use the USB cable only to the to the to the computer. It's because in PhD two when you connect it. How's it? Up, how's it going to know? one camera from the other camera if you go straight to the computer because on the mount when you do connect equipment mm -hmm. there there are two things that you have to select the camera which you would be zwo asi camera and the mount which would be zwo usb st4 ascom i believe and if not that um oh a uh, celestron scope driver ascom that I have. Okay, then then you would click on that. You click on your ASI, and when you connect, you connect all. Um, it should connect. And you'll be you'll be communicating through the USB cables, one to the mount, one to the camera. And for controlling where the, 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 the mount is pointing, you could use something like Stellarium or Carter's to Seal or whatever to um, uh, select objects to look at. Oh. All right, Ed, I think uh, got something to try there. So, hey, Brian, do you have anything interesting you want to say? Yeah, I got a couple problems here uh, you might be able to help me with. Oh, great. Um, first of all, most of everything I've ever had in astronomy has been used or broken or something, and, and I'm just sort of new to this whole sport. And uh, so I bought uh, a pile of uh, astronomy stuff for 50 bucks. I think I shared a lot of it with you guys. I've, giant mount that Jerry thought it was a coast um, instrument and that's probably all junk but um, and there was some cool astronomy books and but uh, there were a couple of um, Dobson's and one of them's an Orion the other's a Mead and the mirrors were shot and so I sent them to um, uh, Bob Fry's I don't know if you guys heard of them. Bees. Bees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, one, of, one of the telescopes had uh, a focuser like this, just a, yeah, what like a focuser. yeah and, and this rod that just went inside the, the telescope. Right. But I want to convert it to a spider. Yeah. And, and I have this. And I wondered if I could just put any mirror here and cut it to this shape, or it has to be silvered on the outside and not on it the has outside. To, it has to be a front surface mirror, uh -huh. and it has to accurately be um, cut at 45 degrees. And then you can, but there's a lot of companies that will supply that. And then you just, it looks like, what's that? What is the, on the surface? Is that double stick? That's a tape? tape you pull off and, and stick okay. and adhere the uh, mirror to. Okay. And that's a 45 right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The mirror needs to be cut on an, and an ellipse to fit that. Yes. Okay. So where do I source that mirror? Just a mirror shop or? or um, a uh, number of places you can get it from um, Astro Systems. They sell secondary. That's a good place. What's that? That's a good place. Astro, yeah. Go to Astro Systems. Yeah. They also okay. sell spiders and holders. But okay. they'll sell you they'll sell you the mirror only okay yeah i uh when i first bought this i thought oh geez it's going to come with a mirror but it didn't 
<laughs> so, uh, yeah, there's a picture of the their assortment of mirrors. They're they're looking pretty thick. Yeah, they will be thick like that. Uh, that, way they, that, that, that way they hold their shape. And they're still going to adhere with this with this self tape, or I need to epoxy them on there. There are some tapes that you can um, get them to adhere adhere with. I've also used epoxy on there to hold them on. And, RTV. Yeah, RTV, or um, I hold I tend to hold mine on mechanically with clips around. You know, hold on a little bit around the front edge. Okay, okay. That okay. way you Tapes can take it. them off easily too. What size of a diagonal do you have there? Um, uh, gotta go by the minor yeah. axis, my minor ac axis of the, the mirror. Shortest distance across the mirror. It's, it's uh, the short distance, the short distance. The short distance, okay. I got two and a half by. No, we just need the two and a half. No, no, I think you need the short one. I one, and, one, the and, short. one and three quarters. Oh, one and three quarters. Yeah. Okay, you had well, one, you have a 1.83. Yeah, you want it to be bigger than so that the mirror sticks out over the edge a little bit, okay. unless you use clips. So, Jerry, how important is this uh, wave PV for the mirror? Um, well, the the better it is, the flatter the mirror is, the better your performance. You don't want if you have a sixteenth of a wave mirror primary, you don't want a fourteenth of a wave secondary. What does PV stand for? Peak to valley. Yeah. Peak that's, to valley. The, that's, okay. all, that's what we mean without saying it when you say, oh, I have it, a it's you know, Tommy, we know when we say quarter wave or eighth wave. Yeah. That's what those are. Is that's a 14th wave mirror. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and you know, the prices as your number get goes up there, you can see that the price goes up. Mm -hmm. So I think really, you know, if, uh, an F, uh, this F14 uh, or F15 would probably work. Now, these mirrors should be. Um, um, should either be Pyrex or Quartz. Exactly. I don't see the composition listed anywhere. Yeah, I, I've never built a telescope before, so this is okay. sort of, um, new to me, and I'm just sort of learning about all this stuff. And uh, I thought, you know, I could have had this one re, re, re silvered, but I wanted to get away from this focuser. Aluminized. Does that, yes. does that secondary mirror, does that come off of the platform it's on? Right, it's just got one screw. No, no, not that. that. I mean, the mirror on the metal, metal mount at the end of the finger. No, it, it's, uh, it's welded. It's welded? That's probably <laughs> epoxy. Yeah. yeah. And, and Although that's epoxy. the metal to the metal. Between, yeah. yeah. Between the square and the back of the mirror, what's that? Looks like the looks like our TV, black our TV or something. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. You might be able to dig that out. Okay. Uh, being very careful. Use heat. And what's the, what's the, uh, what's the, di the minor axis of that mirror? Uh, one and a half. Oh, that's too small for you anyway. You can't use it. Yeah. Too it's small for, for that spider. It, it also looks like the, uh, it's, it's scratched or the, the uh, surface is. Uh, yeah, that might just be the coating. Yeah. At Astro Systems, uh, I think the guy's name is Randy. Yeah, that's okay. right. And, and Randy's really a nice guy. You know, he'll ask you questions and walk you through what you need. And, you know, the, the spider, uh, the spiders and, and diagonal holders they have. You buy a di you buy a diagonal mirror and it literally slides in behind um, like little clips and then there's like a it looks like cotton that's behind it like some kind of bat batten material that'll hold it firm and God that's just all that's all you need you don't need to use tape or any of that stuff it'll it'll just fit in there but uh -huh. they're not that expensive and what's it, the, okay what's the primary diameter eight eight okay. inches okay. Yeah. yeah, so a 1.83 is going to be like, that's optimum, right, Jerry? That's that's right there. Yeah, and so the 1.83 is going to be a really nice diagonal. And if you if that if that holder that you have will do it, as what's far as the, attack, what's the F number? Uh, couldn't tell you. It's a very old, made in the United States, uh, uh, Orion. Huh. So 
If it's uh, on, on my eight inch F5, I use a 2.05 inch secondary. Oh, okay. But that's because I want to take pictures over a wide field with the stars are uh, completely illuminated. So you Is can the tube a real long tube? What's that? Yeah, if it's a long tube, you don't need as big a secondary. Yeah, if it's a, if your tube is long, if it's fairly long, it's probably like an F, what F eight, and then right. if it's really if it's really a long tube, it is a long tube. Yeah, then then your one seven five will be fine, or one eight three. Okay, one point eight three, and and the guy, you know, if you have an idea of what the focal length is, you know how you would do that. You can measure it. You just measure your tube and tell Randy what that is, and he'll give you a ballpark of what you need and. One of the things he's going to ask you, if you buy the spider and holder from him, he's going to want it, you to. He's going to want you to provide what's the ID of that tube and the OD. But if you're going to use the one you have because it fits the tube you have right now, then you know he might be able to help you with like, well, how am I going to attach it? And you mm -hmm. could show him a picture of that, and then you know send him a picture of it. And, He'd be able it, to really. It's, help it's a sauna tube. It's a cardboard sauna tube. Okay, okay, and and um, so if you're if you're intending on using the spider that you have now, um, with that tape that you have, um, I think Jerry would agree with this. Is that you know, you know, the double sided tape is that's fine and everything, but you know, you kind of want you don't want on a cold night and then it's out yeah. in, the in a cold night. You don't want that thing just falling off on you, so you know you might want to do something else to uh, right. adhere it with. Uh, you know, there's is, a, there's a double sided tape that comes with red, solid red uh, coating on each side that you peel yeah, it's off. Yeah, it's polyurethane. It's gorilla tape, for example. You Whatever don't want that is, stuff with, that is with the a green toughest. backing because it, it dries out after a while and it loses its stickiness. It well, falls they'll apart. like hell. They'll really hold hard. I've had one. Some of my stuff stuck together with that red tape, and I'm very, very impressed. It never lets go. And when I tried to take something off with that, it, it was just like trying to scrape epoxy out from underneath of it. Oh, it's hell. It's hell. Yeah. It's, you know, some of the double-sided tapes. I was doing some woodworking, and I had a I had a double-sided tape they use for golf grips. I mean, I couldn't get it off. I had to put a, a spatula in between it, and it took forever to get it off. Some of that stuff holds like crazy. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I, I I think this stuff is a, a 3M uh, product. I mean, you can see the Scotch uh, pattern on it. Yeah, yeah. That's it. You yeah. know, it it, it 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 would probably hold. You know, some guys use silicone. You can, uh -huh. and you <clears throat> you know, and and that that might hold too. Yeah, it does. Uh, and so you know, you know, like I said, if you call Randy and you get you buy your diagonal from him. He's really that a nice good. guy. He would probably really be helpful in, in advising you on holding it. The difficulty with holding these things on with silicone or epoxy is that the spacing between the mirror, back of the mirror, and the, the pl holding plate, it has to be, it has to match the holding plate's angle. And you might right. bond it in at a tipping at a slightly different angle. <clears throat> yep. And then you have to accommodate to that in how you adjust your mirror. Yeah, um, there's four four screws, so it can take up a little slack for yeah. sure. Yep, what, yep. What you would do is, uh, as you glue it in, you'd stick three nails around the circumference to act as a tripod, and then pull them out once the uh, glue uh, uh, dries. Yeah. The other so, thing you can do is if you have little glass beads that are all the same diameter, you know, like 10 microns or something. You can sprinkle these in your epoxy and then you press it on until they're all yep. lying on the beads. And those beads are the spacers for the bonding agent. They right. act like a perfect spacer. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, the next thing I, I have, a, a the only new telescope I ever bought, a Skywatcher Evo Star 10 ED. And uh, the, the focuser, it's, it's got uh, just a, a flat surface here. And before I would, I would try to, uh, you know, put in a different lens and stuff and the thing, it just fall down. And so I read about flattening this. There was some couple of high areas on either side of that flat area. I took a hone and, and honed that. 
and then adjusted, took it all apart and adjusted the screws. And uh, it just doesn't seem like it's ever quite right. It, yeah, it the, of, uh, the screw down there on the bottom between, not that one, the other one, one, that one, that, that increases the tension. Right. So it, it holds the, it makes the eyepiece focuser not move on its own. Yes. Yeah. It's yeah. still, it's still moving on you when you tighten that down? Um, no, when I tighten it down, you can't move it at all, for sure. Yeah, so that's but the same when you're trying to focus, uh, especially fine focus. It's just, I don't know if you can hear us. What does it sound, grindy? Yeah, it's just uh, not very smooth. And I that's don't bad. know about lubricating it. I don't think you want to lubricate it or what. Yeah, lubrication's fine. Uh, and and it would get on this flat surface here. You don't want it on the flat surface there, no. No, yeah, right. It's so metal on metal contact. Three, it's friction only. There's yeah. there's there's the one bearing here, and then there's two rollers on the other the side. thirds of it here. I could lubricate those possibly. No, don't lubricate any of those. That's a okay. uh, Crayford Crayford okay. focus that you've got. All right. So Just it's checking. very smooth. But it, now, should I, not, it should not grind. I, I, yeah, and I think you can tighten uh, things in here too that that have kind of a press against the the, the yeah. whole shaft. Yeah, for and I've tightened those kind of uh, as much as I thought appropriate. What did you say the aperture was? One hundred and ten millimeters. Yes. Okay. Uh, no, a hundred. Oh, it's a hundred. Oh, it's four inches. Yes. Yeah, it's a hundred. The two element or three element? I two. Element? Two. two. Okay. You know the F number? Uh, no, not off the top of my head. Uh, no. Well, what's not the focal four. length? Just divide the two. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Like I say, oh, here it is. It's uh, uh, F900 millimeters, 900. That's its focal length. Yeah, so, so it's, it's an F9, F9, right? F9. Yes. That will perform very well. Yeah. So, but I'm, I'm just getting to where I can get to focus the thing without falling apart. Yeah. There you go, right there. That's it. Yep. Yeah. I've only had it a very short time, so uh -huh. I'm learning, and uh, I don't have very many uh, two-inch uh, eyepieces either, but... Uh, well, you can get an adapter to put an inch and a quarter in. Absolutely. It, it has an adapter. Okay, good. You're covered. Yeah. So, Jerry, you know, it says it's an ED glass element. Right. Um, right. How does that compare to an APO type of uh, refractor? That's a, that's a tricky definition. People have been to court over that one. Yep. Um, the, back in the day, say the 1950s, when... Um, what was the name of that famous refractor that was out there all the time that everybody lusted after? Unitron. What? Unitron. Yeah, Unitron. They made their optics out of traditional um, soft glass, crown glass, and flint glass secondaries after a Fraunhofer formula. And to get good performance with low color, they made their um, telescopes F15 and F16. <laughs> And they got, That's cheating. They got, yeah, they got, well, it was what they had to do to get top-notch performance. They got color otherwise. But now the um, enhanced diffusion glass, uh, the ED glasses are much, much better designed. They um, provide an extra element of design control that wasn't available in the first optical glasses available, you know, post-World War II. So by the 70s and 80s, people were able to make glasses in limited batches that um, had different properties. And so they were able to design telescopes uh, at F9 that performed the same as two element telescopes that performed the same as these F15 and F16 refractors from Japan. And that became the dominant market. The astrophysics made one called the Firestar or something and Mead made one called the 152 ED, six inch diameter. And uh, now everybody makes one that's, because the designs are very good. So your telescope is a very good telescope. 
the EV, whether it's an APO, which is the short for apochromatic, achromatic means non-chromatic. Apochromatic is another version that means non-chromatic. And where the borderline is between those had used to be set between the two elements and three elements in old style glasses. Now the ED glasses are starting to take over that area of the, um, where the three elements worked at faster focal lengths. So it's a, it's a, it's a fuzzy borderline. The, I, can, uh, I remember I, talking to you um, a short time ago and you were saying that some uh, eyepieces work better in some telescopes. Uh, does that pertain to this telescope? Yes, as well? it does. And it does to the old ones and it does to your eye. So eyepieces that work very well for one person in one scope may not work for another person in the same scope or a different person. You have to test eyepieces if you can. And if you get one that doesn't work for you, no matter how, you know, a, a exclusive a brand name is, sell it and find one that works for you. Mm -hmm. There's a wide frame of them. The, the early telescope eyepieces, back when things were, you know, the 40 inch Yerkes refractor was a, an F22. And it had eyepieces that were, um, not, what were they? Um, Higgins and Rams and eyepieces. Yeah. yeah, things that we consider total junk. We wouldn't even bother throwing them away. Just get rid of them. Um, mm -hmm. But on these F, and they work great on F16 telescopes. But on these faster F9s with ED glasses and the F5s that are out there now, uh, those old eyepieces don't work very well. So there are new ones that work extremely well, and they have very wide eye uh, field of view, something like 100 degrees. 120 and, degrees. The, yeah, scientific. 100. yeah. Now, yeah my 9 so millimeter is 120 degrees. Yeah. Now, wow. Did you say this was an Orion scope? Oh, no. He said it more scientific. Skywatcher. This is, a, this is a Skywatcher. Yeah, okay. So um, the, the, the best modern eyepiece is a reinvented Plossel, the best cheapest one, because Plossels are very high performance, especially with new ED glasses, and they're very cheap to make. It's very easy design. So you can get really good eyepieces for less money, but they're not wide field. If you want, right, wide, you, know, you, you got to move degrees, into degrees, fifty-five degrees. Right, you got to move into things like Nogglers or Explore Scientifics. I forget what they call theirs. Your your. Um, I, you, I have a Explore Scientific fourteen. That's my really only good lens. Okay. Um, so they make excellent that, eyepieces. On that scope, it would be a pretty good. That would be a pretty good eyepiece because it, because the at the F nine. Uh, you're going to be doing a lot of planetary. So, the, you know, like a, a 14 to 20 right in there, it's going to really give you a lot of power and good, good planetary, lunar mm -hmm. and planetary views. Brian, what's the field of view on that one? Uh, I don't have the, the lens in front of me. Um, well, well, it's going to be narrower, Tom, than like an, yeah. it, it's, it's going to be kind of like when you, you're yeah. using uh, equivalent of a Schmidt Cassegrain. That, yeah, that, well, that one is 100 degrees yeah. that you're showing right there. That's a 100 degree field of view. Yeah, yeah. that's that's a 100 degree apparent field of view, not a 100 right, degree right, field right. of view. Right, right, right. Right, well, you divide by the power that you got. Right. So your, your telescope at F9 is going to give you a slightly less wide field of actual view, but you can, but the eyepiece will give you a, a, a very impressive apparent field of view, which will take your breath away. Mm -hmm. They're also mm -hmm. sharp edge to edge, and they yeah. have wonderful contrast. Yeah, they they're really good. handled the, the stray light. They got a lot of baffles and stuff in them. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I bought that used from a guy up the street that was selling a uh, another telescope and, and actually got a, you know, I think I paid 250 bucks for it. So I got a pretty you good got a deal. deal. Yeah. You know, the, the Astronomics has come out with this AstroTech uh, one, and, and it's a, uh, kind of reasonable price, at least it was 250 bucks for similar 100 degree views. And mm -hmm. like here, so 250 bucks for a 13 millimeter. So I, I bought, I think a tw the 20, I think that they had. That's my favorite eyepiece. 250 bucks, 100 degree field of view. And seems like a pretty good yeah. eyepiece. Mm -hmm. That sounds very good, yeah. It's a knockoff. Wonderful.
If you're so 900 you're millimeters, on, you're going to be about uh, 70, 70 uh, power. And for a four inch, uh, for a four inch uh, uh, telescope, uh, you know, your sweet spot's going to be anywhere from like 70 to 90 power. You know, they, they really perform well there. No more than about 120 power on a good night. And four inch scopes just don't like to be pushed further than that. Mm -hmm. Well, these are things I got to learn. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, you I divide that, your help. You divide that you. focal you guys... length of the eyepiece into the into the uh, focal length of the scope, which was what nine hundred. Yes. So if you had a fourteen millimeter, you know, a fourteen millimeter eyepiece and into nine hundred, you know, you're around sixty four power. That the way I got it here. And uh -huh. that and. And that's, you know, um, so you could, you could even go down to, you know, 10, a 10 would give you 90 power, a 10, 10 millimeter eyepiece and 90 uh, power, 90 power, a 10 would give you 90 power. So, you know, between the 14 and 10, you're going to have a lot, lot to look at there. But one of the, uh, one of the things that is a downside on the, uh, of course, I did this, they only have a Oh, 12 and a half to 15 millimeters of ivory, but they do make one, which is a 17 millimeter. That's a 92 degree field of view it has, uh, what, almost 30 inches of, uh, 30 millimeters of eye relief. So if you're wearing glasses, you can still see the full field of view. That's a good what, point. Most what of eyepiece is that? What are you talking about? Which eyepiece are you talking about? Explore scientific 92, mil, 92 degree field of view, uh, 17 millimeter. Uh-huh. I have one. It's a good. It, I use it at star parties because when people have glasses, they come up and look at one of my eyepieces, and without without taking the glasses off, it's like looking through a straw. You don't see the hundred degree field of view. You don't even. Holy see cow! They're that. not cheap. <laughs> oh no! no. <laughs> you pay for Jeez. performance here. Oh, here, here it says tw tw twenty millimeters of eye relief. Yeah, that's right. Wow. Right. Right. That's the price of a used car. <laughs> it used to be. No, it's. Uh, I bring about ten thousand dollars worth of stuff to the star parties, you know, and, and lenses and eyepieces and stuff. Probably wow. not the best thing to advertise here, Bruce. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll see you soon. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, guys. You're welcome. Any anybody else have any comments they want to make or Mike? Are you coming up with a new show? Are you still there, Mike? Uh, next show is going to be on the moon. We'll be covering the you know general information about it, what to look at, and um, probably featuring some of the websites for uh, you know finding out the moon. There's a there's a couple good sites for finding. Um, finding objects, uh, you know, sort of the replacement for the uh, rookie book, you know, this. Jim, are you carving another uke guitar? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're looking at that. I didn't realize I was back on screen. There's the, I'm carving the, the heel now of the, of the guitar neck and I, these, these slots, we, they let in the sides of the guitar, and, and boy, did I butcher that. So there's, I'm learning a lot, second time around. But carving the carving the heel is really interesting. It's a, it's you know getting that shape to be a nice, sexy shape and everything. It's not so easy. You, you use chisels and sandpaper and all kinds of stuff. But yeah, I have a. Do you play? Yeah, horrible. <laughs> <laughs> I've been playing since I was like in fourth grade, and huh. and, and you know you'd think I'd I'd get better. <laughs> so you you take you take uh, requests and people say, "Can you play far, far away?" <laughs> <laughs> no, but I can go there. <laughs> I, yeah, it, Tom, you got some of the those images for me. You mean like this one? Yeah, there's a, there's the there's the ronky gram for the mirror that eight inch mirror I'm, I've got, which is just about. This is a little bit longer than what I have. I'm just about at an F five for an eight inch mirror, and uh, holy cow, 
<laughs> that, that's one of my guitars I blew up. And there's inside R. So when I started this mirror, it was intended to be like about a F4.6 or something like that. And I immediately went, I, went, I was after grinding and polishing, it went out to 81 inches. So it was over F5. And then now it's somewhere just under F5. It's like a 4.9, something like that. But these, for the purposes of what we're looking at, those, those images I sent you last week um, of the wrong these, these, these are drawings of what it should look like, right? That's right. That's what, that's right. And, and if, if, Without a yeah, turned edge. There we are. So um, what happened the last time I was figuring this, uh, boy, this is that's out of focus. Anyway, the, when I when I did that, um, there's outside. Oh, it actually moved. And there was a there's a couple that I had. Uh, <laughs> there's inside R. I took I did two sessions, and the first session uh, I, I I don't know what order you have these in, but outside R, the ones that look is where the the uh, where the pattern turns out like that. One of them, I had a slightly turned edge. And so I went back and I figured for about only about 15 more minutes. And I went back and tested it and I put a knife, I, I got a, a, a knife edge on it. And when you go right to R, when you go right to focus and you, you, and you adjust that knife edge, so you're looking just past the blade. Um, what you wanna see is you wanna see a dull gray area in the center. But the outside, you can see how the outside of this mirror, you can see this, this white halo going around the outside. <laughs> but if you do it just right at R, that halo will go all the way around. And you'll, see just, you'll just see a faint uh, white light that goes all the way around. Tom Whittemore calls it the angel's halo. And, uh, and, and Jerry, the last time I did that, after this 15 minute <laughs> session, I could swear I had a really nice uh, angel's halo going all the way around. Uh -huh. And I tried to go back and and uh, and do it again. In this image, check check this out real quick. Um, okay, the lines to either side here of the central line, um, just the width. If you're looking at just the width here, and then go yeah. back to that image uh, of the other one, and just check the the widths. Just that's what you want to, uh, um, and especially this one. If you look at this one and you go to one of those images of outside R of, of the what it should look like, uh -huh. pay attention to the width of these lines. And I think that there is a little bit of discrepancy. There's something there that's not quite uh -huh. right. So Tom, if you go to that one that ha shows the outside R uh, in, in the white. The, the drawing. The drawing. There. So notice that the outside lines are fairly fat and the inside lines the, the inside line itself was the thinnest. Then it gets a little wider, and then at the outside line, I'm 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 adjusting my uh, I'm adjusting my my tester to get yeah. five lines. And when you go to that other image of outside R of what I do have, it's fairly good. It, it you know it, it's it's not too bad. You, so, rather than make all these qualitative statements and looking at the fine curvatures and stuff, you need to be taking quantitative data with the Foucault measurement. Jerry, I tried taking data. I tried like crazy using the knife edge and a pin stick. Yeah. And I'll be damned if I could get it. Tom, the last time we met at, at Broder, Tom was trying to get the, the, the shadows, the little donut shadows to, la yeah. to land on a, on a pin stick. And they just weren't there. And well, I don't know. A, that's just alignment. You know, here you've got it misaligned a little bit because you see the brightness of the top right bands is 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 much more than the top left. So the mirror is tilted a little bit with respect to where you're looking. They're not symmetrical either. No. <laughs> so you need to you need to practice with the Foucault measurement. I know they're hard. They they it takes a lot of practice. And fine shading that maybe our aged eyes are not up to anymore, but uh, that's where the that's where knowledge about the surface is going to be. Either that, or send it to um, Mike, and he'll look at it with his bath. Well, well, where I'm at right now is I mounted this inside the scope, 
and I took it out on the night that we had a first quarter moon. And I wanted to see what the quality of the mirror was. I didn't uh -huh. get a chance to do a star test on it. But, you know, I, I was talking to Tom Whittemore about this. And the images I had, I sent, I sent uh, an image of the moon I took through uh, one of those little Orion uh, iPhone holders. I sent that to Tom. You've got it somewhere there, Tom. And, uh, and you know, it, it, the, view, the, the picture I took that I sent to Tom, in no way was it as good as the, Im the image that I looked at through the scope. Uh -huh. it, was, it was much better. And uh, where's that thing? Oh, it's the other way. So, um, it's off center. And it, yeah, there we this go. There it is. That there it was the night that we had first quarter, and I just kind of zoomed in on it, and it's soft because taking a trying to take a picture with that iphone you just tap it and it moves everything this was the clearest one up that i got but i got some this is really without, this is without a coated mirror yes and and the, and the views i got of the of the moon were just incredible they were really nice uh -huh. so what i did is i talked to tom whittemore and i said now that i got it mounted by the way getting this in the tube in one of those uh um, mill, uh, the, the uh, mirror cells by, um, oh, who makes those? The aluminum University, ones. University Optics. Yeah, yeah, University Optics. Getting that in into the tube was a real pain in the butt. Mm -hmm. and so, uh, you know, I ended up, I ended up uh, just saying, okay, well, I'll, I'll just, uh, uh, I'm going to leave it in the tube and then I'm going to take it up to Tom Whittemore's and we're going to try to do a star test. Then I'll pop it out of there and he can Help me with I a little try, try to take try. pictures of the star inside and outside focus, something that's straight overhead and bright. Okay. Will do. Okay, good. I'll look forward to seeing that. Yeah. Uh, speaking about Ronke, um, it's been a major talk on certain other uh, websites or um, news things. You know, nobody can seem to get an inexpensive Ronke uh, screen anymore. Um, they're now about $150 to $500 because William Bell doesn't make the inexpensive plastic ones anymore. I didn't, I didn't catch most of what you said. Oh, okay, hold a second. Uh, can you, Mike, you, can go to, you can go to that um, Edmunds Scientific. Yeah. And the glass ones are the ones that are just great. And there's one that's not as expensive as the others. They're about 150 bucks. Right. But it's a glass etched one that are really good. I'm using Tom Whittemore's now. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, you're right. The, nobody the, makes but, it that they used to make them in uh, Britain, UK, and here, and nobody makes it. So uh, they're, they're scratching their heads trying to figure out how do you make one uh, on your own. So, I mean, for somebody who's trying to start out to make a telescope, um, that's an expensive hurdle to get over. It's almost as much money as a focuser, you know what I right. mean? Right, right. You well, can make, well, make them that are adequate in performance by um, downloading the pattern onto a printer and print it on clear plastic. You got a good printer, and most of them are. That's an idea. That's an idea. They're, they're also, um, I don't know. I, I, you know, the acetate, the, the old, the old uh, ones that you can mount in a slide, are the ones that we were using. And, yeah. and we, trying to find William the slide Bell. holders is a trip too. But but uh, you know, if you can get if you can get just the acetate. And, and mount it in a little slide, that's the way to go. But Jerry's right, you almost have to print it. Um, uh, the, what, what was his name at, at, uh, at uh, Bowman Bell? Perry. And the, the last one that Perry sent me was, uh, it, it, it had a little ripple in it, somebody had poked it. And I told him about that and he just wouldn't believe me. Yeah. So finally, he, after much argument, he finally sent me another one. 
and I just wanted a hundred line per inch uh, acetate, and then I was going to mount it myself. And so I got one of those left. And and uh, but I think you can still go to Edmund Scientific. There's there's two sides of Edmund Scientific now. One is for the kids toys, and the other one has all the yeah. One's Edmund Optics, and that's the one you want. That's the one you want. Yeah. And they still have a fairly good glass, two inch glass uh, glass uh, hundred line in. At hundred line per inch, you have to pay one hundred fifty. But you know, you, unless you want to print it out like Jerry was saying, you're kind of stuck with that. This is a, a reflective grading. How do you get one that's not reflect reflective? They just you have to search for Rocky. Really. Yes. Oh, you look for transmission. That's uh -huh. those are reflective ones are for um, spectroscopes. And this is a grading. You don't really want a grading. You want a ruled. Um, there we go. Filter. Well, I printed some of those on viewgraph material, hundred lines to the inch. <clears throat> yeah, that's fine. They work. Yeah, these are these are gratings. They're uh, grooves and cut by a diamond into glass. Just and just and they don't have the pattern, the black and white pattern of transmission or no transmission that you want for Ronke. Just these type are to disperse the light, not to transmit it. Type Ronke screen. Okay. No results. Ronky grading. Ron, How about just just Ronky? Ronky. There we go. Yeah, you had it there for a second. I'm wrong. There it is. Okay. Rulings. Which one? Yeah. High precision Ronky or precision. There. Yeah, there's two, there's some that are really expensive. They got slides you down here. No. Yeah. Like have some kind of slide here. No. That's it. That's something different. Too. Yes, it is. You want you, you want, want 100, 100 line pair per inch. Up, 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 there. Uh. That's a one by glass. One. No, you don't, don't want opal glass. Two, really. No. You, you want clear. Oh, is opal not clear? Yeah, opal okay. is the um, white. The white. Okay, you're right. But so it they, get, they have pre-made ruling glass slides. Over on the left. Oh, pre. You got slide here and fre variable yeah. frequency target, whatever that is. I don't know. Probably this, Go probably this one. Precision. Go. Probably this one. One inch by three and 100 lines per inch, $210. Yeah. You you know you have to Tom you, it's kind of hard to find because I had to I had to kind of like bounce around until finally I found the one that I wanted it was like a two inch by two inch and wow. and it, and it's you know like and I, and I think it is the float glass and not the fuse our, uh, our testers are made to take a two inch by two inch um, slide holder or filter that's right. Go to high precision. High first one, okay. Yeah. Up. Uh, uh, chrome on glass. There. Yeah. There. That says chrome on glass. Okay. Yes. Cool. Yeah, I think that's what you want. Then you uh, yes. etch away um, between the chrome to get inches, the two inches by two inches. Oh, yeah. by two inches. Yeah. Oh yeah. There they are. At the very bottom. Oh, geez. Six hundred dollars. Yeah, but those. Yeah, but those. Those. There's a cheaper one. There's a cheaper one that's like one fifty. This is the expensive one. That. That. <laughs> I'll, I'll vote for that. Yes. <laughs> oh, down here. Records. Oh, let's see. What's yeah. the, these are cheaper there down are. here. There's a two hundred two hundred five for this one. Oh, it's probably that's probably the one. It's gone yeah. up to two hundred five now. That was yeah ten years ago. That's inflation. Yeah. By England, they're 233 pounds. 
much more. About $300. Yeah, for a 100 line C inch uh, yeah. grading. So you're saying chrome, the chrome makes it for lines? The chrome is no, deposited they, 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 lines. They plate it and then they etch away the chrome in the middle where they want the light to go through. Uh, okay. They put a mask on it and then photo, you know, photo, photo, photographically put a mask yeah. and then they, they etch, just like making ICs. That's right. cheap. Exactly. Cheap, 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 cheap. Okay, I think we've reached our limit for tonight. What do you think? Okay. Yeah. I think you've gone over. <laughs> okay, well, thanks, everybody. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you. See you next time. Bye. Okay, so I'm going to stop share. And good night, everyone. Bye, guys. Ending meeting. Ending meeting. Later, guys. <laughs>